Next topic for us is reaction mechanisms in section 19.7. And this is really interesting because now we're really getting into the details about how chemical reactions occur. Most chemical reactions do not happen the way that it is implied from the balanced chemical equations. So we're going to say most reactions do not proceed literally as they are written in a balanced equation. And the equation that I'm going to use as an example is 2NO plus O2 turning into 2NO2. So the way that this equation is written, it implies that two NO molecules and an O2 molecule come together and react and form NO2. And that's not how it happens. So this is not, this right here is not an NO with an NO with an O2 reacting all at once. Think about what you just learned about collision theory. Think about um, activation energy and achieving that transition state. In order for a reaction to occur, we have to get our molecules um, lining up perfectly. They have to have a good collision, which means they have to have a perfect alignment with each other and they have to bring the right amount of energy into that collision. And so the odds of two molecules colliding perfectly are pretty slim. The odds of three molecules simultaneously colliding with the correct orientation and the right amount of energy is really, really slim. So it, it, uh, for this particular reaction, this is definitely not how it happens. This reaction that we're looking at actually occurs in two steps. The first thing that happens is that those two NO molecules react with each other to make N2O2, which is not something that's listed in that uh, first equation that I wrote. And then the N2O2 reacts with the oxygen, O2, and that's where we get our product, 2NO2. So this reaction up here actually takes place in two steps, which are shown down here. And in each of these two steps that we're looking at, we only have two reactants that need to collide with each other, two NO molecules or an N2O2 with an O2 molecule, which is much more reasonable when we're thinking about the criteria for a good collision. So these two steps, each one individually, um, the two steps themselves individually, these steps are called elementary steps. So the, the individual steps that make up an overall reaction are referred to as elementary steps. This up here we call the overall reaction. And together, the two steps together in order as a set, as a set of steps, this is called the reaction mechanism. So again, because the notation here is kind of tricky, we say things that we would say is, here's the overall reaction, 
the reaction mechanism has a series of two steps. Each individual step is known as an elementary step. So here's elementary step number one. Here's elementary step number two. Together, the elementary steps are called the reaction mechanism that lead to the overall reaction. So let's talk about our reactants and our products. In this reaction, we have the reactant NO, which is right here. And we also have the reactant O2, which is right here. And we have the product NO2, which is right here. And then we have this other thing, N2O2, which is a product for elementary step number one, and it's a reactant for elementary step number two. Any molecule like N2O2 that is featured in the reaction mechanism but not in the overall reaction is called an intermediate. The term intermediate is very much like reactant or product. Uh, an intermediate is, let's, let's come up with a list of what it means to be an intermediate. It's not a reactant or a product of the overall reaction. So when we only look at the overall reaction, it doesn't show up anywhere. It only shows up in our elementary steps or in the reaction mechanism. It is something that is formed and consumed during the reaction, during the overall reaction. So one elementary step will form the intermediate and then a, a later elementary step will consume the intermediate. So it isn't a reactant and it isn't a product. It is not the same thing as a transition state. Uh, let's do kind of a refresher on what a transition state is. So if we have like um, a reaction diagram like this, here is our reactant, here is our product, this up here is our transition state. The transition state is sort of this weird in-between phase where bonds are being broken and bonds are being made and it's not really a real molecule, it's just like that in-between moment. So it's not a transition state, it is an isolatable detectable molecule. Sometimes transition or intermediates are hard to isolate. Sometimes they're hard to detect, but they can be isolated and they can be detected. So, so where would, on an energy diagram like this, where would a transition state, excuse me, where would an intermediate even show up? Um, well, in order for us to see an intermediate, we would have to draw our energy diagram a little bit different. So here's our energy and here's our time, and here is our reactant, and here's our product with something like this. I'm gonna, I'm gonna modify this, I don't copy it yet, and there's our transition state. Our intermediate is formed somewhere in between the reactant and the product. So maybe our intermediate is formed like right here. Like there would be our intermediate. So we would have some change in energy as we form our intermediate, a transition state as we're on our way to the intermediate, and then we would have another transformation as we switch the intermediate into the product. So this would be an energy diagram that shows the formation of the intermediate and the transition from the reactant to the intermediate and then from the intermediate to the product.
Before we get into a, a worksheet on this, the last thing that I want to talk about is something called the slow step, also called the rate determining or the rate limiting step. When you have a, a multi-step reaction, so when you have a reaction that has a mechanism with two or more steps in them, each of those individual steps has its own reaction rate. And typically, one of those steps is the significantly slower than all the others. So in all reaction mechanisms, one elementary step is much slower than the others. And this slow step is what determines the rate of the overall reaction. The slow step determines the overall reaction rate and it also determines the rate law. So how does that work? Let's go back over to this multi-step energy diagram. And I'm actually even gonna modify this diagram a little bit more. I'm gonna make the transition from the intermediate to the product just a little bit different. So if we were looking at this as our possible reaction, we've got two steps. The first step is the reactant turning into the intermediate. And then the second step is the intermediate turning into the product. And each of those steps has its own activation energy. So for the first step, the activation energy is right here. And for the second step, the activation energy is right here. And we could just, you know, thinking about what we know about energy, this is a lot. That's a really big amount of energy that needs to be absorbed to get up to that transition state. So it's pretty logical for us to make the assumption, it is an assumption, that going from reactant to intermediate is the hardest part of this reaction. And once it gets through this hard part, the rest of the reaction is gonna be a piece of cake because the activation energy is much smaller and you're heading way downhill. Look at, that's an exothermic reaction, whereas the yellow part is an endothermic reaction. Just all in all, that first step seems really nice and easy. Uh, no, the first step seems really, really hard. And so it would be logical for us to say, this first step is gonna be the slow step. This, first step is what will dictate how fast the reaction proceeds overall because once the molecule gets here the rest of it is going to happen comparatively really really fast <laughs>